Well, thank you for being seated. Our final invited panel will share with you a new initiative at the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. We are very pleased to have this panel presentation and look forward to a continuing relationship. The discussion of neuroaesthetics is an appropriate topic to conclude this ANFRA conference and a good bridge, good connection to a potential shared future. I'd like to introduce Julio Bermudez. Thank you. Uh, welcome to our last session. Um, basically, this afternoon, what we're going to have is four speakers. Three of us will speak for 15 minutes and one uh, uh, 30 minutes. And we time it so there is time for a question and answer, hopefully this time, at the end. Um, I'm Julio Bermudez. I am a professor at the Catholic University of America, where I direct the Sacred Space and Cultural Studies concentration. And I've been presenting work in the past. So let me, uh, because I want to make sure that we have time, I'll introduce the first speaker today. Uh, it's uh, Susan Maximin, and she is the currently, currently serves as a senior advisor to the Science of Learning Institute and the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University, and uh, is executive director of the um, uh, Brain uh, uh, Institute on uh, Neuroaesthetics Initiative, uh, and that's why she's uh, going to be basically leading today the conversation I'm presenting the, the topic. So please, Susan. Hi, everybody. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I am um, certainly here to represent uh, Johns Hopkins Brain Science Institute. Um, two of our uh, leaders were not able to be here today, both Jeff Rothstein and Ruth Huguenier. Is this better? OK. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to speak just to you. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I have to say, I'm Eric's biggest fan. So thank you. Um, so thank you, Ampha, for um, uh, inviting us. Um, this has been a wonderful conference. Um, in many ways, um, you know, the talks t today, I think, in service of education, in wellness, um, looking at the role of health, justice, and how neuroscience and um, architecture can really um, help to solve some very big problems. Um, I'm going to um, spend some time talking about um, the initiative that we've launched at Johns Hopkins. And like many programs, um, this has been um, 10 years in the making. Um, in 2006, uh, Johns Hopkins um, launched a program called the Brain Science Institute, and um, it was uh, funded by a very visionary family who was interested in really making um, a dent in understanding how the brain works. Um, we looked at three primary um, goals. One was to really fund basic science and to do that through an interdisciplinary approach. Um, and we formed um, a concept called working groups where in order to be funded in really an incubator seed model, we um, brought folks together from across the university to be able to put proposals together. The second thing we did was create five cores. So looking at emerging technology, looking at imaging technology, so 500 neuroscientists, neurologists, cognitive scientists, psychologists could use these cores. And the third thing we did was create a neurotranslational program to really look at how we could take research to practice and then ultimately be able to bring that to industry, bring it to practice through lots of different kinds of partnerships, um, some commercial, some pharmaceutical, some nonprofit organizations. So those three things in the first four years gave us a lot of really great learning and great successes in really creating um, what is the Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. Um, once we were able to do that, we um, were able to start to think very seriously about a passion um, that um, had been really a part of the, the in initial um, genesis of the Brain Science Institute, and that was looking at neuroaesthetics. So in 2010, we had our first Science of the Arts event where we brought together um, researchers and artists from around the world to look at um, sensory systems. Um, and the goal was to look at, to make it interdisciplinary, to make it really about the rigorous science 
around sensory learning, and then to really look at some of the practice implications. And that could be with artists, with dancers, with architects. Um, we were looking at music. Um, the Peabody Institute is at Johns Hopkins, so we have a really deep and very um, um, strong relationship with the folks at Peabody. We also um, then did five other uh, programs over those the last four years. One with um, Steve Shaw on touch, um, one with Ed Connor on visual perception, and he'll share a little bit about that today. We had Eric Kandel come and work with us and share his reflections on some of the things he talked about today, but also thinking about the age of insight and, and the role of um, neuroscience in the arts. And um, we also did some work with Lonnie Sue Johnson, who um, was a New, York, uh, New Yorker illustrator um, who had a um, serious um, uh, mental, mental health issue where she was no longer able to draw. And we're able to work with her over the last five years to really understand what happened when her hippocampus really was destroyed and what kinds of function she was able to maintain and to rebuild as an artist. So we've been very interested in this idea of the intersection of arts and neuroscience. All of that work um, really provided lots of great learning about how we bring artists together with researchers, how we think about big problems, things that we want to solve, whether that's in education, in health, in wellness, um, really starting to think about how we um, create strategies to come at these big problems. Uh, so in 2015, we were um, able to really officially launch the Neuroaesthetics Program Development. And I just want to talk briefly about that. Um, we um, pulled together uh, an executive advisory board that included folks from all disciplines, from arts, humanities, neuroscience, cognitive science. We have a museum director. John Eberhardt actually serves as one of our executive advisors. And we were able to bring a group together to really start to vision what it would look like if we could create a neuroaesthetics institute that really was a container to really hold together all of this work um, in a way that allowed researchers and artists and architects to be able to work together. Um, and to do that, we looked at programs all around the world. So we looked at programs in the United States. We looked at programs in Germany, in Japan, in Norway. We looked all over the world to really try to understand what those programs look like. And in doing that, have created now a database of what we call stakeholders of about 7,000 folks that are interested in this intersection of the arts and architecture and neuroscience. And then started to put together sort of what might this look like for us, and I'll, I'll share that in a, in a moment. Um, we've also begun to forge partnerships with AMFA and other organizations. The goal is to really be a place that can house these conversations, to really think about building a community in neuroaesthetics, and to be able to really um, provide that thought partnership and that thought leadership that really brings these kinds of conversations forward um, on an ongoing basis. Um, and then last, we are now establishing a research working group to really look at funding primary research at Hopkins, but also outside of Hopkins with all of the different stakeholders that we're talking about. So we're extremely excited about that. So our mission um, um, has really been something that very much we see as a living um, statement, but it is the capacity to be moved and affected by space, form, sound, movement, and images is a profound distinctive attribute of being human. Our vision is to explore how the brain processes and responds to the aesthetic experiences and environments and spaces. We aim to build the field of neuroaesthetics by collaborating with scholars from a range of disciplines including neuroscientists, art historians, artists, architects, and cognitive psychologists. So this year we are launching the International Arts and Minds Lab and it is the neuroscience of human experience. Um, interestingly, it's called the IM Lab. That is our shortcut. And um, you know, when you think about um, Camus, I think therefore I am. I think it's really sort of a perfect, a perfect name. Um, we really have thought a lot about what we know about experience and how we um, can create more ex more brilliant experiences and how. By thinking about this more deeply, we can really impact lives. So the Arts and Mind Lab is really formed in the pursuit of this knowledge. And we, we're looking at doing three things. Um, one is research. 
Um, the second is convening, and the third is sharing. And I'll speak just briefly about that. Um, we will be um, bringing together researchers, as I said, to both at Hopkins um, through interdisciplinary collaborations and also outside of Hopkins to really form a very strong research uh, agenda and to begin to implement that um, beginning in 2017. Um, several folks at this conference have talked about the role of emerging technologies. We're very interested in thinking about how we can use virtual reality and other kinds of technologies to really um, simulate environments and also be able to look at biological measures. And I think more, or and, and also to be able to um, start to build data, um, data sets, large data sets, where we can start to share that information across different disciplines. So starting to see what are the effects of different spaces, what are the effects of different kinds of um, stimuli to really help inform other researchers. So this idea of big data in this field becomes very interesting, especially when you think about it as an open access opportunity. Uh, secondly, uh, we're looking at convening. Um, and we'll be doing that at a number of levels, both um, bottom up and top down. We'll be having small gatherings um, across the country. We'll also be having our first large symposium in the spring of 2017. And we'll certainly make sure that everybody um, has information about that. Um, and we'll also be doing um, different kinds of convening using technology. So we'll be doing webinars and other kinds of convening in order to really start to build a dialogue. Um, the third thing that we're looking at is education, practice, and communication. So um, we're now, uh, we just launched our first music cognition class at Hopkins. Uh, we will be expanding our education offerings, uh, including hopefully certification, but also um, looking at fellowships. And then we're very interested in interacting with um, practitioners. So, and that will be a variety of practitioners from artists and architects, uh, dancers. We have a number of folks um, who um, have already been part of this work over the last five and six years that will continue to build that out. And then um, communications and looking at how we can communicate within our community, but also to the general public. So um, last week we launched our website, which is um, artsandmindlab.org, and I invite you all to, to, to please visit. You can sign up to receive additional information at the bottom of the website. And um, what you'll see is it's a very um, delicate site. It's, it is not a big site with tons of content. What we're really hoping to do is begin to build a community. And so there's a blog, which is an opportunity to really share perspectives. Um, we have three, um, three posts that have been um, recently posted. But we're really interested in having um, the community share your point of view and your information. So, so we invite you to, to let us know if you're interested in adding a conversation. Um, there's, there's a forum to share. We think that right now the, the field is at a, a nexus where the more talking we can have with each other, the more we can share what we're thinking. I really enjoyed the last session where um, the f different folks shared their points of view. Um, and so we'd love to have you share that um, on the forum. Um, we're not posting papers, but we're really looking for 500 words or less of a perspective on a research that you think is interesting, on, an, on, a, on a way that you might approach a problem, um, because that's where the energy really, really is. Um, so um, in closing, I just want to tell you a little bit about our future goals. Um, we are now actively recruiting a um, scientific director. Um, we will be implementing the research agenda in 2017. We're going to be launching um, what we're calling now an honorary advisor um, program panel, and that will include both artists and, um, and researchers. And this is a group of eight to 10 folks who are really eminent leaders in the field that will help to inform the direction and the growth of the, of the organization. As I mentioned, we're having our symposium in 2017 in the spring. Um, focusing on community building, um, really expanding interdisciplinary partnerships, and we'll be looking at launching our educational programs late 2017 and then you know beyond. So um, in closing, I think this idea of the marriage of art and neuroscience um, 
really provides us an opportunity to solve big problems that come from knowing more and in doing something about it. So thank you very much.